Welcome to our first lecture covering the topic of labor law. Um, all of the material that we're covering in this course is important, of course, and uh, much of it is very interesting. Uh, but for me, at least, nothing is more interesting from a practice perspective than labor law. Uh, this is by far my favorite aspect of my employment when I was a labor and employment attorney. This course is called employment law. It isn't called labor and employment law. But most people who practice in the labor and employment law area don't call themselves employment paralegals or employment law uh, attorneys. They call themselves labor and employment attorneys. L and E is a common shorthand for it. And that's because labor is a really, really important part of the story, at least from historical perspectives. Um, if we were to go back and to say the 1970s, um, and the practice that existed then. Uh, the practice area would have still been called labor and employment law, but most of the emphasis would have been on the labor law side of it. In the 80s, the transition happened and employment law became more important. And that was a function of the fact that there were additional laws that provided additional protections and that made it uh, easier and more financially advantageous for plaintiffs to pursue actions in court, which then, of course, made the filing of those actions more common. So there was a significant increase in the number of employment law cases filed in the 80s. Uh, but another important part of the trend was that the number of labor activity, the number of union organizing campaigns, the number of collective bargaining agreements that were negotiated significantly declined uh, during that time period. And so we saw kind of a, a seesaw effect. It used to Labor and employment used to mainly be labor. And by 1990, it was um, very much, especially in Texas, but really throughout the country, very much of an employment law practice. And that's probably the reason why our course is now called employment law instead of labor and employment law. And that's why we just get one chapter on this really, really fascinating topic. Um, the topic of labor law is as complex as probably everything else we've covered in this course. Certainly, if we were to look at all the discrimination law, all the labor law is easily as complex, I would say more complex than that particular section of the law. So in this presentation, I'm going to have to distill really, really interesting, important stuff to a relatively short amount of time. And we all know I'm not good at that, right? am I right? <laughs> so I'm going to do my best. But I want to start by telling you that if you have the opportunity to practice in this area, go for it. Because it is so interesting and so fun and so rewarding that I highly, highly recommend that you consider this practice area. And if I don't capture its majesty and uh, uh, its interest, uh, I apologize. It's just hard to talk through all the things we did talk about. and make it sound as interesting and as rewarding as it is. So let's begin. This area of the law is going to be very different than employment law. Um, it is an area that is um, uh, a much more confrontational practice, a much more political practice, a much more uh, uh, strategic practice. Um, it, it really pu pulls many, many more skills from the legal professional than employment law typically does. And uh, that's what makes it so challenging. And that's what makes it so interesting and rewarding. And so uh, we'll be talking about many of those things. But many of the things we've talked about to this point about basically been doing employment law. Um, the whole paradigm, the whole way of looking at the law is going to be very different when we talk about labor law. The vast majority of labor law predates employment law. Um, in fact, employment law really didn't get started in any significant amount to the 1960s. And virtually all labor law predates that time period. So um, we're, we're really looking at a different way, almost of viewing the world and certainly a viewing employment relationship. So I hope that that element of the story uh, comes through. So as much as possible, kind of almost forget what you've learned at this point about employment law and uh, kind of start with a clean slate as we talk about labor law. 
I'm going to cover a fair amount of history here. Uh, you don't need to know the details, and I'm not going to get too much into the weeds in terms of the details. But I think it actually makes it easier to understand the story of labor law if you have an understanding about why things were happening. And in order to understand why things were happening, you need to know what was happening at that time. So we are going to do a little bit of history. On the test, I'm not going to ask you historical questions, uh, but uh, this may help you organize the material in a logical way. Of course, at the heart of labor activity is the collective bargaining process. This is why unions want to organize. This is why workers want to join unions, at least those workers who want to, and that is that they want a contract. That is the end game for a union. And so collective bargaining is the process by which the company and the union get together to negotiate a contract. And in many respects, the co collective bargaining process is very similar to any other contract. Uh, both sides have things they want to accomplish. In some cases, uh, their interests are opposed to one another. For example, every dollar that the union is able to get for its employees in terms of wages and benefits is one dollar that the employer has to pay out. So there's a zero-sum game sometimes. But there are other aspects in which uh, the, both sides are on the same side. They both want the business to be successful because obviously if the business fails, then the employees will be out of work and the union won't have any customers the customers being the employees of the union. And so uh, it's a dance that happens when, when you are in collective bargaining. Uh, both sides want to do the best for um, its side, but they also recognize that uh, doing too well could actually be self-defeating because if the other side is in uh, too weakened of a situation, it damages the overall kind of fabric of the relationship. So what is collective bargaining? Well, it's the negotiation agreements between management, and here we're talking the company, and labor. Here we're talking the union. And this could be, and oftentimes is, but it usually is, the actual workers who, who actually work in the facility, although they do receive support and guidance from the union in most cases. So it's negotiation agreements between management and labor about wages, hours, and other terms and conditions of employment. And again, the ultimate goal is that contract. The collective bargaining agreement almost always it replaces that at will status that we've been talking about uh, from the very beginning. Now it doesn't happen on day one if the uh, labor union and the management do not re uh, reach a collective bargaining contract then the employers will remain in an at will status until a collective bargaining agreement is reached. And there actually have been collective bargaining agreements that have included an at-will employment relationship, although those are very rare contracts. So it's possible to have at-will employment, certainly at the beginning of the uh, union unionization period before the collective bargaining is passed. And it's even possible to have it afterwards, although that would be very unusual. The contract is going to define uh, what those terms and conditions might be. Uh, some contracts are going to discuss, uh, well, it, it often has to be industry specific. What are the concerns that people in this particular industry or this particular uh, profession might be focused on? Again, if you don't have this term in your uh, quiz already, please be sure to add that. So now we're going to talk about history. Again, you don't have to know dates or um, uh, details, but I want to put it in perspective for you. And so here we are, we're going to talk about the history of unionizations, and then we're going to talk about an overview of the Wagner Act. Uh, Mr. Wagner actually was, I believe, a senator. He might have been a congressman. Um, and so uh, it, it's not unusual for laws to be named after the senators or congressmen who um, uh, were instrumental in passing it. You may have heard of the law, oftentimes it's called Sox, Sarbanes-Oxley. Well, that was named after... Paul Sarbanes, and I don't know what Oxley's first name is. But anyway, two senators who were instrumental in passing that law. So when we see Wagner Act, we know that some senator by the name of Wagner was instrumental in the passing of this act. Um, it is oftentimes called the Wagner Act, but the, the longer, more formal name is National Labor Relations Act. And we're going to talk about a concerted activity by employees. That's we're going to talk about many things, but that is a subcategory that we'll spend some time talking about.
And then um, in subsequent lectures, we'll learn about uh, how union campaigns work. And uh, they're, they're, they're very, very exciting. They're very much like uh, running a political campaign, say for a senator or a president or something like that. You have campaign slogans, you have posters, uh, both sides are, are very much involved in uh, presenting arguments and uh, 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 it's a very interesting process. And then we'll, then we'll also talk about how the actual election is conducted. And again, it works very much like just any other type of election. We'll discuss in more detail the collective bargaining process and what happens when collective bargaining doesn't work out, which oftentimes does happen. Uh, obviously, the, the best case scenario is the parties are able to enter into a contract, but many times the parties are not able to reach a contract. And so therefore the parties either continue uh, working together or sometimes the, uh, the, the uh, employees decide to strike. We'll talk about the topic of unfair labor practices, both the unfair labor practices that employers can be guilty of, as well as the unfair labor practices that unions can be guilty of. Um, the Wagner Act, the first law in this area was a very pro-union act. And so not surprisingly, uh, many people felt that the, the Wagner Act was uh, too favoring union activity. Not everyone agreed with that, but it was a, a pretty common belief at that time. And so uh, two other congressmen, Taft and Hartley, uh, were instrumental in passing another act that uh, was, if this was perceived of as pro-union, the Wagner Act, then Taft-Hartley is perceived of as pro-management. And these, again, it was called the Taft-Hartley Act, but what it did was amend the National Labor Relations Act. So it, the, these changes are actually part of the National Labor Relations Act. And one of the big parts of Taft-Hartley is the right to work laws. And then after that, sometime there were perceived to be uh, problems in many unions. Many unions had problems with corruption. And even uh, union supporters to this day agree that there were times, and there have been times where uh, mafia and other uh, connections to organized crime uh, infiltrated certain unions. And uh, so these, this was an attempt to root out some of those problems and not just uh, corruption involving uh, organized crime, but also just garden variety corruption where uh, union officials would um, uh, sometimes engage in uh, self-serving actions. And we'll conclude briefly talking about public sector unions and how they work. We won't get to all this in this lecture, of course. So let's talk about our historical perspective. Uh, up until the uh, 1990s, unions were basically illegal. Uh, they were considered restraints on trade. They were considered monopolies, just like we can't have uh, one corporation be the only provider of um, a particular product uh, because that would result in monopoly power. The belief at that time was we can't have um, all of the employees affiliated with one union because then the union would be able to exert monopoly power based upon its control of the workforce. And so for this reason, this, these antitrust concerns, unions were considered criminal conspiracies and they were considered um, antitrust violations. And so they were unlawful. And in fact, courts would routinely issue injunctions about unions. So here's another word. Uh, the, the term injunction, of course, doesn't just relate to labor law. It relates to laws generally. Um, I mean, excuse me, it relates to court actions generally where um, uh, the, a court orders an individual or a group of individuals or a corporation to refrain from doing a particular act. Could be striking, could be something else that the court has determined is unlawful and that would cause irreparable harm to somebody. So again, I'm using this term in the union context or in the labor context, but you can have injunctions in every area of the law. Let's talk about yellow dog contracts because these were common in this era of, uh, in, the 19, or excuse me, in the 1800s and even the early 1900s where companies would insist that employees sign an agreement in order to begin or maintain their employment with that employer that would uh, say that the employee would agree not to join a union, did not, that, that the employee currently did not join, was a member and would agree not to join the union. And these were contracts. Uh, the, the term yellow dog, I actually Googled this, uh, 
because I, I, I wondered if it came from the expression yellow dog Democrat, but no, it doesn't. Um, and here I found on Wikipedia the answer here. Um, this was actually a, a union organizing term for these contracts. Um, it, okay, and this is something from the United Mine Workers Journal. This agreement was well named. It is a yellow dog for sure. It reduces to the yellow dog any man who signs it, for he signs away every right he possesses under the Constitution and the laws of the land and makes himself the truckling, helpless slave of the employer. So the idea is a yellow dog is a meek and uh, subservient, uh, kind of a subhuman idea. Uh, uh, and so it's kind of beneath the dignity of men. At least the union was arguing to, arg arguing to enter into these yellow dog contracts. Yellow dog contracts are absolutely unlawful now, but for a time they were completely lawful. And we'll talk about how they came to be unlawful at a later time. But if you grew up knowing the expression yellow dog Democrat, it has nothing to do with this. So uh, don't, don't try to see a connection there. Uh, as I said before, this is now, this would be a, an unfair labor practice that, that the employer would be committing if the employer required employees to sign yellow dog contracts. They would be completely unenforceable. Uh, so certainly they would be unlawful from that perspective, but just asking an employee to sign this would be a serious violation of the NLRA. So obviously employers don't do that anymore. Um, there were uh, some initial actions by the Congress to protect uh, labor organizations, uh, but these were held to be unconstitutional uh, because back then, uh, the, the, US cons the U.S. Congress, which is obviously part of the federal government, could only, well, could only, well actually this is true today, but, but back then the understanding was a little bit different. Um, just like today, uh, the Congress can only act when it, has, when it can point to a provision in the Constitution that gives it the authority to act. So the assumption in our Constitution is that Congress has no authority in and of itself to pass a law unless it can point to a clause in the contract or into one of the amendments. And so what Congress would do is, is, is pass these laws that uh, attempted to give some rights to union organizations, but if they didn't and, and, and they purported to do that, but then the courts would say, Congress, you don't have the right to do this. Um, and Congress would say, well, yes we do because of the clause in the contract that talks about interstate commerce. Um, that Congress has a right to regulate interstate commerce. But at that time, uh, the interpretation of the Constitution held that interstate commerce was a very narrow term um, and that it did not give Congress very many regulatory powers at all. Now today, interstate commerce is a very broad concept. And in fact, um, most of the activities that Congress engages in today are based upon the Interstate Commerce Clause. Uh, for example, any kind of environmental protection laws, any kind of um, regulation of industry, almost always is gonna be based upon the Interstate uh, Commerce Clause. Uh, you may have heard about uh, a tax on uh, the Affordable Health Care Act, which is sometimes called Obamacare. And one of the bases that people who oppose that law a use to attack it was the uh, Commerce Clause. And what their position was, well, Congress has the right to regulate interstate commerce, but it doesn't have the right to require that people engage in interstate commerce. There's a difference between regulating it and making people engage in a particular act of commerce. And buying health insurance would be an action of forcing people to engage in this type of interstate commerce. And so the argument that was advanced was, that um, the, the uh, fine or the penalty that was associated with people who did not buy the required insurance um, that and this was, is a provision in the Affordable Health Care Act, that this went above and beyond the power of Congress to regulate. Um, now, the, the US Supreme Court agreed with the, um, uh, the people who opposed the Affordable Health Care Act to say that it is true that Congress did not have the authority under the Interstate Commerce Clause to force people to uh, uh, buy health insurance. 
but it had the authority under the taxing clause of the Constitution. And then, in fact, the penalty wasn't a penalty so much as a tax on people. And since the, the Congress had the ability to tax in this way, that that was the source of the, of the authority that Congress had to act in this way. Now, the Affordable Health Care Act continues to be under some uh, a shadow because there are still people who are seeking to challenge it. So I don't know where the, the path going forward in the future will be. So what's most interesting isn't so much about the Affordable Health Care Act, of course, that's an interesting topic as well, but is that our, our understanding, and when I say our, I mean our country's understanding of this interstate commerce clause has changed hugely from a very unimportant part of the Constitution to one of the most essential parts of the Constitution. And so when we talk about um, interstate commerce, it's important to have an understanding about how that term has evolved. And lately, it's perhaps contracted just a little bit. Some of the decisions that the Supreme Court has made has shown that interstate commerce authority isn't without limitations, so to speak. So there were some laws passed that were designed to um, uh, address uh, some of the interstate, uh, the antitrust aspects of unions. And um, uh, again, uh, as, as the uh, workforce became more unhappy with industrialization and with the working conditions that they faced, and many times the working conditions were appalling, um, uh, people would be in very safe environments, people would be paid very little, people would have to work lots and lots of hours, including children. Uh, I mean, uh, for us today, they were you know, kind of beyond appalling. Um, and there were not protections that existed for individuals at that time. Uh, really, the only way that employees, other than leaving a particular employer to go to work for another employer, uh, which probably had the same uh, labor conditions, so there, it was difficult to avoid that in, in employment for individuals. Um, and many of the people working under these circumstances uh, did not have um, a lot of skills. And so they were not able to attain employment uh, that would give them more opportunities. And so uh, they really kind of their only choice was to, tr to strike in some of these cases. And the businesses used that injunctive injunction that we talked about before to stop these strikes. And of course, businesses also used these antitrust laws here to break up the unions because they, the, the, uh, these, uh, the unions uh, kind of by definition violated these antitrust laws. Um, so this was a fairly dark time in terms of the labor organizing efforts. Um, Congress attempted to amend the law um, to uh, allow employees to organize, but um, this didn't require that employers recognize the um, unions. It simply meant that the unions were no longer unlawful, that they could exist, but not that the employers had to listen to what they had to say. A pretty important law, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, is the railway labor law. If you've ever heard of times where um, a particular airline is negotiating with its union, you'll oftentimes hear about a mandatory arbitration in the National Mediation Board. And that is a function of the Railway Labor Act. If you hear about it, it's going to be in, con in the context of airlines and railroads. It's not going to be in context to most uh, labor situations because the statute is limited uh, to those situations. Um, but there is a mandatory arbitration of uh, if, if the parties cannot reach an agreement, a contract on their own, then it does go into mandatory arbitration. But we'll see there is no mandatory arbitration for the vast, vast majority of unionized workers in the United States. And again, this is the end of our discussion about this. But obviously, if you go to work for Southwest Airlines or American Airlines in their uh, labor uh, departments, you'll need to learn a lot more about this. And by the way, they do have um, active uh, uh, departments in those areas because they have very um, important uh, labor or, uh, agreements. And so if this is, this is an area that speaks to you, those would be smart places to consider working. So the Norris LaGuardia Act um, removed the impediments to organizing unions in the United States. And you can see this date's pretty important because the Great Depression had just started. 
times were really, really tough in the United States. If times were tough in the teens and the 20s, um, they were probably even worse in the 30s. Uh, there were a lack of opportunities for employment. And when people were employed, they didn't feel like they had very much in the way of protections. And so this was an attempt by Congress. Again, we can see we have Mr. Norris and Mr. LaGuardia. We think of LaGuardia as an airport, but he was a human being, a Fiorello uh, LaGuardia. Um, and this law was passed to um, uh, uh, stop uh, the impediments to organizing efforts, to stop injunctions against strikes and picketing and boycott. And it made illegal those yellow dog contracts we talked about before. Um, state uh, judges, though, still maintain the power to issue injunctions if the workers' activities became violent. And of course, that remains true to this day. Uh, most union uh, organizing activities and most strikes are peaceful activities. But there certainly have been occasions in history where they have been violent. Sometimes they've been violent because of employer action. And sometimes they've been violent because of union action. And of course, both are uh, criminal behavior. And uh, courts are able to stop that when there is violence or the threat of violence. Then again, uh, the, the, uh, the Roosevelt and the Congress uh, working to develop the New Deal package during the Great Depression uh, continued to a press for uh, protections for workers. And one of those was the National Industrial Recovery Act. Uh, but the Supreme Court declared it unconstitutional. Again, it had to do with that definition of interstate commerce. The Congress had exceeded its power by trying to regulate um, employment in this country. And this, was a, a this wasn't the only law that Congress uh, uh, thwarted the president and the Congress about, or this was the only uh, law that the Supreme Court th thwarted the efforts of the president and the Congress to address uh, the, uh, the Great Depression by uh, pumping in lots of money into the economy and by uh, improving the lot of workers. Uh, in fact, you may have heard that FDR at one time considered packing the court, adding to the Supreme Court more liberal members who would be more open to a broad definition of interstate commerce. He didn't do that uh, because the Supreme Court kind of on its own decided to uh, expand its definition of the interstate commerce clause. Uh, many people think that the Supreme Court changed its position because it was responding to the threat of packing the court by increasing the number from nine justices, perhaps to 15 justices, so that the court uh, would be willing to uh, agree to the policies that FDR and the Congress wanted to advance. Um, I don't know if that's the, the real reason or not, but certainly the Supreme Court started giving FDR some wins and started uh, interpreting the commerce, the Interstate Commerce Clause more broadly. And that brings us to the Wagner Act. Yay, we're getting to the fun stuff now. This was enacted in 1935. This is the major labor law. Again, we'll talk about two big amendments to it, but those amendments didn't really get to the heart of the Wagner Act. They were tweaks, maybe significant tweaks, but the heart of the Wagner Act uh, remains in force to this day. And that's what we're gonna be spending most of our time talking about. So it's kind of interesting that a law that was passed during the Great Depression to address an economic crisis that was really unprecedented in modern times uh, continues to be so influential in our lives even to this very day. So um, this law, the National Labor Relations Act, or you can call it the Wagner Act, is the true beginning of modern labor law. Everything we've said to this point were kind of preambles. Uh, either they were minor tweaks or minor relief for workers, or they uh, were held to be unconstitutional. But with the Wagner Act and when it was held to be constitutional, really a new day dawned for American workers. It was huge. Uh, rights were guaranteed to workers to both to organize and to bargain collectively and also to strike. It is, this law also established the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, 
And this board, which became a, an agency, a, a significant size agency, it oversaw uh, union elections and it would handle unfair labor practices, which are typically called ULPs. Uh, initially, under the Wagner Act, there was a focus on management misconduct. Um, and later on, we'll see that also union misconduct was being addressed. Um, but these are the uh, kind of the key takeaways from the Wagner Act that we're going to flesh out in the coming several slides. So after the Wagner Act, unions started flourishing. And this resulted in um, expensive strikes, expensive for uh, the economy, expensive for the employers. And uh, there was some backlash against uh, the, the power of unions. And so as a result, as the country political powers uh, shifted from the uh, New Deal Congress to a post-World War II Congress uh, that was more conservative and that was more concerned about making sure that the uh, business world worked as a well-oiled machine, we see the Taft-Hartley Act, which again was in 1948. You don't need to know the year, but um, that's the year that it was passed. And it, was, it amended the Wagner Act or the National Labor Relations Act and made it more employer friendly. Um, it created a complaint system for union unfair labor practices. So there was that symmetry. Not surprisingly, employers can violate employees' rights, but unions can also violate employees' rights. And so uh, this gave the employee the opportunity to uh, complain about unlawful behavior by whomever might be committing it. It also established right to work, or actually established a method that states could elect to be right to work states. And we'll talk more about right to work states as we go forward. And it were, uh, uh, developed a cooling off period for unions and for um, um, employers. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, there was, uh, during this time and after this time, a significant amount of corruption in unions. Uh, organized crime uh, was especially connected. You may have heard of Jimmy Hoffa and the mafia. Well, Jimmy Hoffa was the head of the Teamsters Union, a very, very important union. Teamsters continued to be a very, very important union in the United States. Um, obviously, um, Mr. Hoffa is passed away, uh, most likely uh, killed because of his ties to the mafia, most likely killed by the mafia, although we, we're, we're not sure what happened to him. But um, uh, concerns, of, and, and not just uh, Teamsters, but other unions were um, had connections to organized crime and or uh, were engaging in uh, uh, behavior that was detrimental to its membership. And so we had the Landrum Griffith Act, again, two, two new names of uh, congressmen, and this law passed in 1959. And this was designed to guarantee that unions functioned in a democratic way, that union members were able to vote on who would be leading their union, and they would be able to vote on union contracts. And this assist, and it, it also gave union members sources of information about the accounting practices um, and, for example, how much uh, the, the president and vice president of the local union were being paid. So these were important uh, sources of information and important sources of protection for union members. And so here now we've covered the three statutes that are important, the Wagner Act, uh, a New Deal um, aspect, the Taft-Hartley Act, a post-World War II um, activity, and then we have the Landrum Griffin Act. Another thing that was a source of concern at this time, by the way, was the involvement, perhaps, of communists in union activity. Uh, you may recall this was during a time that we were in a Cold War with the Soviet Union, and there was great fear that it would become a hot war. And it was also the time of the McCarthy era. You may recall Joe McCarthy was a senator who um, used his position to um, uh, uh, slander and misrepresent um, lots of people's um, um, involvement with communist organizations. Today, we don't really take communists very seriously, most of us. Uh, but there was a time in our history um, not so much in the 50s, but earlier, probably during the Great Depression, 
and perhaps before that, where uh, communism was viewed as a, 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 a possible uh, way to organize the economy. It was kind of before the world saw the abuses and the human rights violations that happened in the Soviet Union. And so some people still had an idealistic ver view of what communism might be. And so it wasn't unusual for a compassionate person who was left of center to get involved in some communist organizations. But again, after uh, the, the World War II and the Cold War started, those, those perspectives were not considered socially appropriate anymore. And they were in fact seen as a threat to our democratic um, uh, way of life here in the United States. And uh, the, the, the Red Scare was a, was a real issue at that time. So Landry Griffin, uh, was uh, arose uh, in some sense in that um, in those political circumstances. So let's uh, go forward uh, to the 1970s into current times, and we have seen a significant decrease in private sector unionization. And there's lots of factors relating to this. One is that um, the uh, traditional uh, heavy industry uh, jobs. Uh, are not in the United States for the most part. We don't have as much of a steel industry or a textile industry as we once did. A lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, con uh, countries who uh, have a lower labor costs are able to uh, produce those items at a significantly reduced price and consumers usually look for the lower price as opposed to the made in the USA label. And so uh, more, of the, more of those industries have moved to third world countries. Uh, some people see that as a bad thing um, because it has caused a certain United States to lose certain industries. Um, and, and sometimes it can even be a dangerous thing for us because we saw that, for example, most mask manufacturers um, were no longer in the United States. And so uh, during the pandemic, when the United States needed to increase its production of masks, there weren't as many people who could easily uh, start producing a lot more masks in the United States. Many of the suppliers of masks were actually in China. And so obviously because of concerns um, about um, uh, the, the virus being in China at that time, understandably, people didn't really wanna source their masks from China. And so um, there can even be kind of national security concerns when complete industries leave a country. Uh, but there can be economic advantages. Uh, for example, uh, we are, our country is very involved in information technology, and those are usually high skills, high income type positions. And so we have the Microsoft, the Apple computer, the Google, uh, the Facebook type industries. And um, those industries have not been subject or haven't uh, seen much union organizing at this point. So we lost the industries that tended to be organized and the, in the industries that we gained tended not to be organized as much. Um, there, uh, so that was one reason. Another reason was that employers began to more aggressively attempt to avoid unionizing. Um, I'm going to tell you a personal story about my time at JCPenney. Um, for most of my time at J, well, maybe about half my time at JCPenney, I worked in the catalog division. And uh, the, that division is uh, basically a warehouse industry. And this, uh, the warehouse industry is um, pretty significantly unionized. And um, at that time, when I began working there in the early 1990s, uh, we had two main competitors, Montgomery Ward and Sears. At that time, Amazon didn't exist as a company, or if it did, it was extremely small. Um, and so uh, those were the people that we saw as our competitors. Both of them had unionized warehouses. And the perception that we had of their business model was that because of unionization, they weren't able to make the um, innovations that were going to keep their business successful. And in fact, both Montgomery Ward and Sears um, exited the catalog business and the internet business. Um, now, whether it was because of unionization or not, reasonable people perhaps can differ. 
um, but um, it was certainly the very heartfelt belief at JCPenney that the reason that our catalog business was much more profitable and successful was that we were able to be much more nimble because our workforce was uh, union free. And um, our, uh, even though JCPenney is struggling um, as an entity now, you know, I guess what, three, 30, years, 30 years later, um, the catalog industry or the internet industry that grew out the catalog industry uh, does continue to exist with JCPenney. So again, that's just one example. Uh, there probably are examples of unions that, I'm sure there are examples of unions that have helped companies innovate. But it is a pretty common criticism of unions that they have many times stopped innovations that have uh, caused companies in some cases to become unprofitable and have caused that, that business to be unsuccessful. Now, of course, your argument can be made that the employer shouldn't have agreed to terms that were going to render it un uncompetitive. And so the, the ultimately, the employer is responsible for the things that it agrees to. But unionization can be an impediment to an employer uh, maintaining its uh, competitive advantage in the workplace. Uh, unions at times have needed to make concessions uh, when there have been downturns in the economy. Um, many of those got a lot of publicity in the 70s and sometimes even the 80s. And so that uh, tended to make people less interested in unionizations because they didn't see the union as that powerful. Uh, NAFTA and other free trade agreements, again, have internationalized our economy and allowed there to be specialization. So again, we don't uh, ma manufacture too many clothes in the United States anymore. And um, generally, uh, the campaigns that have happened, the union campaigns that have, have happened in industries, uh, they haven't been as successful as they have in the past. And part of that may be that uh, unions by many people are perceived of as um, a blue collar type um, uh, uh, part of employment uh, and also a male focused part of employment and workplaces that um, are heavily female and are more white or pink collar are uh, not as likely to see themselves as people who uh, would benefit from unionization. And that's a perception, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but uh, that is a difficulty that unions have had to overcome. Un uh, labor unions are not a major part of our economy in Texas. We see them in the airlines and we see them in a few manufacturing uh, places. Um, and uh, that's mainly wh where it is. And so uh, you won't see a lot of active union activity if you stay in Texas. But if you move to other parts of the country, you're much more likely to see a union activity in the private sector. And many states and even the federal government allows some organizing in the public sector. And in fact, public sector unions in many states are growing at a significant rate. Um, in Texas, we don't have public sector unions or at least not true unions um, in the sense that they aren't collective bargaining. Uh, they're not involved in collective bargaining. So the public sector is an area where we do see a lot of unionization in other states. Okay, so let's talk about the Wagner Act. Again, the other name for it is the National Labor Relations Act. I'm going to call it the Wagner Act, though, because this whole law is also going to include the two amendments that we talked about. Um, so let's go forward here and talk about the NLRA. So again, here's a summary. The, so there are, there are the three parts of the NLRA. The Wagner Act, which is pro-union. Taft-Hartley Act, which is anti-union or pro-management. And the Landrum-Griffith Act, which is anti-union pro-management. These three parts make up that larger law, the National Labor Relations Act. Again, I'm going to be talking about each one of them separately, but don't think that these are separate laws. The Wagner Act was the first law, also called the National Labor Relations Act, and then this law amended this law, and this law amended this law. You don't, for this course, need to know, well, was this particular provision of the National Labor Relations Act uh, 
part of the original Wagner Act or was it added under the Taft-Hartley Act or was it added under the Landrum Griffith Act? Uh, you don't need to know where it comes from. Um, we are going to, I'm going to kind of cover it in the um, order though that the laws were passed. So we're going to talk about the Wagner Act first, just because I think it helps tell the story of labor law a little bit clearer, but don't worry about learning what was in each one of these acts separately. Let's first of all talk about vocabulary. I hope you've gotten the message, I'm sure you have, kind of beat you over the head with it, that vocabulary is really important to these uh, topics and that is certainly true in labor law. A lot of the terms that we're gonna be using don't mean what they mean in average ordinary conversation. And these aren't terms that you would hear in average ordinary conversation. And so you won't probably have heard about these before unless possibly you or a family member have been involved in a union. And even then, you may not have heard the technical terms that we're going to talk about here. So be sure to add these terms to your uh, quizlet so you'll have them. The first is community of interest. These are the factors employees have in common that for bargaining uh, that can be used for bargaining purposes. For example, they may have the same skills. Uh, they may um, uh, interact with the same equipment or the same products. They may have similar pay systems. They may share the same supervisors. They may have to follow the same personnel policies. Um, in order for uh, a union, when a union comes in, uh, let's imagine it's a large facility. Let's say the facility has a thousand employees. Well, when a union starts, it typically has just a handful of people that are interested in it. These may be workers who were affiliated with the union in their previous place of employment. These may be workers who feel that they have been wronged at their place of employment. They may have family members who are unions, union members. And so they typically contact the union and say, hey, we're interested in joining the union and we want you to organize in our facility. Well, the union will probably say, well, how many people are at your facility? Um, and let's say that the employees know that it's about a thousand people. Well, the union is gonna say, well, listen, um, we're gonna have to uh, convince a lot of people to join us if we have a thousand people, how many people are involved right now in your group? And probably these workers are gonna say, well, it's just us. Maybe it's five people, maybe it's 10 people, but it's probably not more than 20 people. And so the union's gonna say, gosh, you know, I mean, with that kind of number, we're not gonna win. It's really not even worth our time to do much. Uh, they may do a little bit of information gathering. They may do a little bit of handing out uh, leaflets to see if they can quickly uh, encourage and, and get other people interested. But still, that's a lot of people. You have to get you know, 100, 501 people to, to be interested in joining the union. If you only have 10 or 20, uh, that's a lot to persuade. And so many times what a union will do is they will say, look, are y'all all in the same department? And usually if these people are friends with one another, they probably work together. And so they may well say, yeah, we're in the same department. We're say in the shipping department. Well, how many people are in the shipping department? Uh, there's about 30, 40 of us. Oh, okay. So there's 15 of y'all that are part of this group and you say there's about 30 or 40 total. That's about half of the department. So maybe what we wanna do is just organize the shipping department. If we just, if because maybe we even have enough support already so we can uh, quickly have a union election, quickly be voted into the shipping department. And then once all the other workers in the facility see how awesome we are for the shipping employees, maybe they'll want to join our union too and we'll be able to add uh, additional departments to, to our uh, group of represented employees and eventually get the whole facility. Okay, so that might be the, th that would likely be the thought process of the union. And so the, the employer though, doesn't want one little bit of its facility to be unionized because think about it, if the shipping department goes on strike, the whole facility now has to close because if they're manufacturing something and the shipping department isn't working uh, and uh, let's say a UPS is the trucking company that picks up all the things they're shipping out, well, UPS workers are Teamsters, and so they're not going to cross a picket line if the shipping department is um, uh, striking. And so the whole facility closes down. 
And, and so that one little department is now going to dictate uh, whether all 1,000 people are going to have a job to go to on that particular day. And so they would be able to exert that kind of monopoly power. And so maybe they could say, hey, boss, you currently are paying us $20 an hour. We want to earn $50 an hour. And the employer's like, but that's way out of out of uh, her perspective, given the, the pay that we pay other people in our warehouse. Well, we don't care about those other people. We care about ourselves. We want to be earning $50 an hour. We're going to strike until you agree to that. And we're going to be able to shut down this whole facility because UPS won't cross our picket line. And so then the employer would have to say, well, we're either going to lose our business or we're going to have to pay them $50. Let's pay them $50. And you can see how um, and then, of course, the people who are working inside the facility will say, wow, uh, the people in the shipping department were able to get $50 an hour. That union's really powerful and really strong. We ought to join that so we can get $50 an hour. And you can see how that would be a very powerful story for the other workers in the facility. And it likely would encourage them and interest them in working for the union or working in a unionized position. So the employer doesn't want that to happen. The employer doesn't want there to be a, a single uh, department that is unionized when the rest of the facility isn't. Uh, they don't want that for the reason I just described, but they also don't want it because they recognize it's much more difficult for the union to organize a thousand people than it is to organize 30 people. And the reality is that there are certain departments within a facility that are more likely to be open to unionization. Shipping departments are famous for being more inclined to be interested in unionization. For one thing, they're interacting with UPS drivers. And so um, those UPS drivers are Teamsters. And many times they're proud Teamsters and talk about how awesome they think being a Teamster is. And so the, those shipping employees um, hear regularly how positive the working conditions are for Teamster workers. In addition, shipping workers are usually male um, and uh, because it's a, a physically demanding job and it is a low skill job. Um, you don't have to have any particular education to become a shipping person. Um, it's mainly, are you strong enough? Do you have the work ethic to do this type of, of work? As a result, low skill and male dominated positions oftentimes are the ones that attract a special union interest amongst the workers who occupy those positions. Uh, but other positions, for example, white collar uh, positions that might exist in the uh, 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 secretarial areas in, in the organization, or perhaps in the uh, customer service parts of those uh, facilities. Oftentimes those departments are dominated by women who have uh, white collar careers. And many times these women have uh, significant skills um, that make them attractive candidates for other employers as well. And they oftentimes are much less interested in unionization than say those shipping department employees might be. So what an employer who wants to avoid unionization would do is to, would be to try to create a community of interest for all the workers in that facility. Uh, because if all of the workers share those community of interests, the union isn't going to be able to pick off a particular department and only unionize that part. In fact, the union would have to organize all the departments that share that community of interest. So in that situation, the employer would work hard to make sure that the pay scales are consistent throughout the facility. That supervisors move around the facility and move from one department to another. And they would likely have supervisors who cross more than one department. So uh, the, uh, the, su su the shipping supervisor may also manage some packing employees as well. They would want to make sure that the personnel rules are the same across the facility. They're likely to want to have a job posting system where somebody from the accounting department can post into a job in the um, loss prevention department and somebody who is in the a secretarial department can post into a shipping department position if he or she wants to. And so that's the ways that you create these community of interest, which would, if the, uh, the NLRB agrees with the employer, would require that the union either organize the whole facility 
or not organize any part of the facility. So community of interest is a really important concept for union avoidance. And certainly it's something that the uh, union uh, would like to, to see the communities of interest be relatively small. And so the, a bargaining unit needs to have, needs to share that community of interest. So the bargaining unit is the unit that votes in the union. It's the group of employees in a workplace that have the legal right to bargain with the employer. So again, if the employer has been successful and it's the whole facility that has the community of interest, then the whole facility is gonna be the bargaining unit. Either the whole unit goes union or none of the unit goes union. If the employer isn't successful and the NLRB holds that no, the shipping department employee doesn't share a community of interest with the manufacturing employee, then the shipping department is going to be its own bargaining unit and the, the manufacturing employee, the one on the assembly line, is going to have its own bargaining unit. Um, and so they can be very broken up. There can be just a few bargaining units or it can be just one. And it all depends upon how the employer has organized the workforce. Now, these efforts to structure the workforce ha occur long before the union campaign starts. So um, some of the most important efforts that an employer engages in to avoid unionization happen even before a facility opens uh, by establishing um, communities of interest across departments, um, the uh, um, employer is um, preparing itself for the possibility that in the future there will be a union campaign. So what is a shop steward? This is a union member who actually is also an employee of um, the company that is unionized. And he or she acts as an intermediary between the union members and the employer. Oftentimes the shop steward may be involved in collecting dues, recruiting new members, um, collecting grievances that employees have against the employer. Um, shop stewards are usually um, uh, people who are very involved in the union. And uh, many times they're people who um, are held in high regard by their coworkers. They're seen as leaders in the place. Or at least that's usually what who unions choose to pick because um, uh, that will increase the stature of the union in the workplace. Collective bargaining agreement, another term for quizlet. This is the negotiated contract between labor and management over uh, the terms and conditions of employment, which includes wages, hours, rules, working conditions, benefits, all of those things. It's typically called a CBA. Now, just like any other contract, both parties have to agree to the terms. So if management wants a particular provision in the contract and the labor union says, no, there's not gonna be an agreement. It's not gonna happen. There won't be a contract. If the labor union wants a particular term in the contract and the management says, no, then again, there won't be a contract. Um, in order for there to be a contract, both the labor union and the management and the uh, company have to agree to the terms. Now, obviously it's negotiated, so the labor union doesn't get exactly what it wants and management doesn't get exactly what it wants. There's a give and take. Probably both sides get a little bit of what it wants. Let's look at the term industrial union. Uh, these are unions that are organized across an industry regardless of the members' job types. Um, so for example, a warehouse is going to have some people that are in the shipping department, some people that are in the accounting department. There's going to be people who are involved in uh, janitorial services and loss prevention services. The jobs performed are going to vary, uh, but the union is going to cover all of those individuals. And we also have craft unions. These are unions like plumbers unions. Um, all the members are going to be plumbers. Uh, many times these individuals um, may not, there may be electricians or, or um, other HVAC um, specialists. These are people who maybe are hired uh, to work for a brief period of time, uh, say building a building or something like that. They come in and they're the electrician who uh, does the electrical work. 
um, and they may um, uh, get their employment through a hiring hall in the craft union. And so the employer who needs a qualified electrician to wire a particular building goes to that craft union hall and um, uses the procedures there to identify somebody to hire for some period of time. So in this situation, the craft union can actually work as a, a placement agency. A business agent is an employee of the union. He or she is the person who um, helps the employees who want the union organizing to happen. Uh, many times employees who are initially interested in unionization are not sophisticated about what the law requires, how that process works. The business agent, of course, is very knowledgeable about that. And so he or she can educate the employees and also give the employees uh, tips about uh, you know, what is effective in terms of a union campaign and how to go about doing that. The business agent also has access to funds from the union. And so a union, uh, if, if it sees that it may be able to unionize a facility, uh, may well be willing to invest thousands of dollars in that effort. Uh, of course, the money that it's taking to invest in that would be from the dues of other workers and other facilities. But the idea is if they invest, say, $1,000 or $2,000 in this union campaign, if this facility actually gets unionized, and let's say it has 1,000 workers, um, those workers are going to start paying union dues. And so it's an investment, just like a company might invest in new equipment so it can produce more widgets or more cars or whatever it manufactures, and that will increase its sales. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the product that the union creates is um, the relationship that it has with the than it, with its members because the members pay union dues and those dues are the quote unquote profit that the union makes. So the business agent is involved in helping the employees organize and also in um, negotiating the contract and assisting in uh, the administration of that union for the uh, workers. Okay, so the NLRA encourages collective bargaining agreements. Uh, that's an important idea. That's the end game. That's why we really have the unions. Uh, so a union that doesn't, uh, isn't able to close the deal with the employer to get the collective bargaining agreement is a union that really hasn't delivered on what it was kind of promising its members and its potential members. Um, so this is kind of the, the important end product of unionization. So let's look at some of the particulars of the National Labor Relations Act. For one thing, it outlawed company unions. You may say, what is a company union? It sounds like an oxymoron. How can it be a company and a union at the same time? Perhaps a better way of describing this would be a company controlled union. An example would be, um, let's say that uh, the Teamsters try to organize our 1,000 employee warehouse um, and they were unsuccessful, but it was a close call. Well, the company might say, gosh, we don't want that to happen again. We want uh, to, as much as possible, ensure that our workers are not going to be tempted to organize with a, an independent union. Well, why don't we create structures within our organization that will make employees uh, feel like they're getting the benefits of unionization, but without actually having a union. And so these oftentimes would be organizations that would be company controlled. They really didn't function as a true union uh, because ultimately the company was telling the union what it could and couldn't do. These um, had sprung up in industries and uh, the NLRA uh, prohibited these from existing. Nowadays, company unions are not a major issue, but there have been a few cases that have held that certain efforts that um, smart companies have engaged in can be interpreted as a, a continuation of that company union activity. And where we see these come up is when there is management, hourly, uh, committees over important issues. And many times these are focused on uh, worker safety, for example. 
So imagine that you have a facility that has had a, a spot of uh, workers being injured. Um, perhaps uh, a forklift has run into some people or uh, people have injured their backs by picking up items um, uh, without the proper safety uh, tools or the proper safety, uh, following the proper safety rules or things like that. And so management says, well, gosh, we're not sure why all these accidents are happening. And the hourly folks may say, well, we know why they're happening. We'll tell you because we're the people doing the work. We know uh, why these forklifts are doing the things that they're doing. And we'll tell you what the problem is. And, and we together can brainstorm ways to fix it. Maybe we need more mirrors so that there are fewer blind spots where the forklifts are riding around. Maybe we need to have speed limits. The forklifts can't go over three miles an hour. Uh, maybe we need to have louder sounds uh, on the forklifts so that they can be heard by uh, workers as workers are walking around. You know, uh, kind of brainstorming about ideas like that. Um, seems to make a lot of sense, but you can see how um, they have some characteristics of unions because they can, in some sense, start talking about the terms and conditions of employment. Because how fast your forklift can drive can be a fairly major issue in how much you enjoy your job, um, how safe you are in your job. Um, how noisy the forklift is can also be an important factor. If you're driving that forklift all day and it's super noisy, uh, that can impact your long-term hearing. And it can also just impact your, your working conditions generally. And so if the hourly employees and management are talking about these types of solutions, you can see how it starts feeling like they're maybe almost reaching a collective bargaining agreement. And so it can come close to this idea of company unions. The important case in this situation, I'm just going to share it with you because if you practice in this area, you'll hear about it often, is electromation. We're not going to talk about electromation in this case, but if you take a course in, in labor law at some point, let's say you go to law school or you uh, decide to pursue this matter more so, you'll definitely hear about electromation. When I was in law school, I took three courses in labor law. It was a passion of mine. Um, very interesting topic. Okay. Um, the, another thing that the um, NLRA does is it identifies um, unfair labor practices that employers can engage in, or, or they're not supposed to engage in, but they may still engage in, because this was under the Wagner Act. And then it identified unfair labor practices of unions that was identified under the Taft-Hartley Act in the 1940s. Um, also, the act establishes the, uh, the procedures by which union organization can occur. That whole election paradigm that we talked about, and we'll get into a lot of the details in a later presentation. And it talked about um, what types of strikes could be lawful and what types of strikes are not lawful. And it made it clear that employers could not refuse to bargain in good faith with the union. Um, that collective bargaining process requires that both the union and the employer bargain in good faith. But if an employer refused to bargain or refused to bargain in good faith, that was a violation of the NLRA. So um, organizing campaigns, uh, the NLRB, the, the board that was established, the regulatory agency that was established by the NLRA uh, provides the rules of how that election goes forward. An important term in this area is laboratory conditions. The idea is that we want to keep the conditions of the election as pure as possible so the workers have the opportunity to uh, make a, an informed decision that is not coerced, not coerced by the company and not coerced by the union. And it's a majority rule situation. Um, it works in the same way that our democracy generally works. Let's say there's a thousand employees who are eligible to vote in the election. Let's say that 800 do vote. You don't have to vote if you don't want to, but 800 do, 200 decide not to. And of those 800, let's say 401 vote for the union. Well, that's more than half of the people who voted. So the union is voted in. 
even though it's less than half of the total number of employees. Well, let's change that up. Let's say that only 400 vote for the union and 400 vote against the union. As we say, tie goes to the employees. The union does not uh, win. There has to be a majority of people voting for the union. Uh, so a tie goes to uh, the maintaining of the non-union status. Its duty, the NLRB, the, the regulatory agency, its duty is to protect the rights of employees to engage in concerted activities and to decide whether or not to form a, a labor union for the purposes of negotiating with their employer. Uh, the employees have the right to organize and they have the right to choose not to organize. Uh, we'll talk more about concerted activities later on, but I do wanna give you just a bit of a preview here. Um, in Texas, we don't have a lot of uh, private uh, uh, unions, but uh, all workers, even if they are not union, can still engage in concerted activities. They can still work together with other folks to alter the conditions of their employment, even without the involvement of a union. That is protected behavior, whether the facility is unionized or not. And so that's gonna apply anywhere. We'll talk more about that going forward. This may be the most important takeaway that you get from this course, because most likely you won't practice much labor law, even if you do go into labor and employment law, just because of where we live. Um, and so we won't have unionized clients in most cases, uh, but the, the possibility of concerted activity can arise anywhere and therefore it's important to be familiar with this. There are two types of strike, well, there's a lot more, a lot more than two types of strikes, but two th 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 there's a common way of dividing up uh, uh, the, the most common strikes. One is economic strike. Both of these strikes types are perfectly lawful. There are some types of strikes that are unlawful and we'll talk about those later. An economic strike is just what it sounds like. It's a strike that the strikers decide to participate into because they want economic gain. A perfectly legitimate reason to want to strike. Maybe they're striking because they want a higher pay or better benefits or uh, more access to overtime hours. Uh, that's a perfectly valid reason to strike. Um, that's one category strike. The other type of strike is a ULP strike. This is where they're striking because um, they think that the employer has committed an unfair labor practice against one or more of the employees. This is also a perfectly lawful uh, type of strike. Uh, which type of strike is in play is oftentimes a matter of dispute because oftentimes both factors are uh, motivation for the people who are striking. It's important to know which type of strike you have though because uh, the right of the workers to return to work at the end of the strike is gonna depend upon whether it was an economic strike or a ULP strike. Um, whether it's an economic strike or a U, I'm sorry, UPL strike, <laughs> sorry, uh, ULP strike. I'm sorry, my, my, my brain is getting tired here. Uh, ULP strike. Um, so during a strike, either one type of these strikes, an employer can replace its workers temporarily. Um, so uh, let's say the people are striking because of a, of a ULP. Um, the employer decides to hire some people uh, who want to come to work and they're willing to cross the picket line. And so these workers continue to work. Uh, the employer and the union uh, negotiate an agreement that resolves the ULP strike and the ULP strikers return to work. They are willing to return to work at this time. So the replacement workers are now out of a job. Whatever they were doing, they have to go to let the strikers return to their former positions. They have a right to rehire at the end of the strike. Economic strikers, the same thing can happen. They go out on strike for economic reasons. While they're out on strike, the employer can hire replacement workers. Obviously, they, the employer is gonna have to persuade people to cross the picket line, and many times people are unwilling to do so but let's assume that the employer is able to do that. So these replacement workers work in the facility. Let's say that the union and the employer reach an agreement, or maybe the employees who are striking just decide we've had enough of this strike 
we want to go back to work. In this situation, the employer is not required to automatically reinstate the strikers. The strikers are eligible for reinstatement as the replacement workers leave their place of employment. So let's say um, there were, this was a facility that had 20 workers. And let's say uh, 15 of the workers are striking. Five of the workers that were already employed cross the picket line and the company hires 10 other workers. The 15 workers decide eventually um, that they don't want to strike anymore, or maybe some of them decide. It may, may be a slow process. And so, um, well, we'll say they'll do it once. So these 15 workers are eligible for rehire. But right now there's no openings in the facility. Uh, two months pass and one of these temporary workers quits. And so now there's only 14 workers. So one of these workers over here um, is now rehired and put back into place. And then slowly over time, all 15 will eventually be eligible to return. But you can see how it might take years before um, there's uh, 15 openings under these circumstances, right? So um, uh, you can see how it's important or it's advantageous for the employees to characterize their strike as a ULP strike so they can get that quick reinstatement rights. Um, the union has a duty of fair representation of all of the people in the bargaining unit. So the union can't play favorites. It has to treat all of the employees in the bargaining unit fairly and non-discriminatorily, even if the employees are not members of the union. Um, now, this doesn't mean that non-union non members have the right to be engaged in union contract negotiations. It doesn't mean that non-union members have a right to uh, participate in union meetings or to vote in union affairs or to vote on the union contract. Um, but um, it does mean that, say, when grievances um, are filed, the union has to handle the grievance of non-members who, who work in the bargaining unit as it would treat the grievances of members. Um, now, uh, as you can imagine, union stewards um, are definitely encouraging members, or excuse me, employees to join the union. And the union steward who's encouraging you to join is also the person who collects grievances. So you can see how there's the potential for a union steward to uh, treat people who are uh, dues paying members in a more advantageous way than uh, the other employees. That's unlawful, but it would probably be kind of naive to uh, not realize that sometimes it happens. We already talked about good faith bargaining. Again, this is an obligation that both the union and the employer have. Um, supervisors and managers cannot be part of the union. They cannot be part of the bargaining unit. Um, and uh, the only time that they can assert rights under the NLRA is if they oppose doing a ULP and they are retaliated by their employer. So let's say the big boss tells the supervisor, go fire Bob because he's involved in union organizing. Supervisor says, I can't do that. That would be a UP ULP. Boss says, you got to do it. I told you to do it. If you don't do it, I'm firing you too. Let's say the, the, uh, the supervisor refuses to do it. The boss fires the supervisor. The, now the supervisor can file a claim under the National Labor Relations Act, uh, asserting that he was retali or she was retaliated against for opposing an unfair labor practice. Um, it's, it's very common to have um, ULPs filed during a union organizing campaign. Many um, are going to be legitimate. Some may be um, a little creative, a little bit of exaggeration, um, because the filing of charges um, can have some strategic advantages for uh, the union. So sometimes unions will have people that are involved in union organizing. Maybe someone was thinking about quitting anyway, and they may say, look, why don't you do something, they'll get you fired. 
And um, under those circumstances, then they can use that as part of their campaign. Hey, look, Bob was for the union. He was fired, not because he did anything wrong, but because he was for the union. If it's a large enough facility, a lot of people aren't going to know what Bob's story is. And so they may find the union story compelling. Um, the uh, National Labor Relations Board may find the story compelling as well. And so that can put the employer um, in a situation where it's having to respond to these charges. And so, again, word of this activity can uh, put kind of a black mark against the employer and may cause some of the employees to be more inclined to support the union. Of course, the flip side is also true. The employer, an unethical employer, can um, intentionally uh, dismiss an employee uh, for no good reason simply because he or she port supports the union. That behavior is unlawful, but certainly employers, just like unions can violate the law, employers can violate the law as well. And so in that situation, what can happen is em other employees can be scared. They can say, wow, um, our boss fired Bob, who's a union worker, for no good reason. I'm worried about my job. If the company thinks I'm supporting the union, maybe I'll be the next person fired. I can't afford to lose my job, so I'm not going to support the union anymore. So you can see how um, uh, the, 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 uh, a lot of strategy is involved in these situations. And sometimes uh, there's a fair amount of dirty ball that happens. Um, let's talk about employee rights under the National Labor Relations Act. As we said before, employees have the right to organize. They also have the right to elect not to organize. They have the right to join an, a union organization that already exists, and they have the right to assist in that organize, organizing process. They have the right to collectively bargain through representatives of their own choosing. They can go out on strike. Again, there are some unlawful strikes, but there are, as we said before, economic and ULP strikes that are lawful. They can picket. Again, not all picketing is lawful, but many types of picketing is. And they can engage in other concerted activities, um, again, uh, union related or otherwise. And of course, they can refrain from doing all of these activities. They can refrain from striking. They can refrain from picketing. So uh, Section 7 of the NLRA is an important part of the law, and this is the part that talks about what employees' rights are. Employees have the right to engage in other concerted activities for the purposes of collective bargaining or other mutual aid or protection. Let me pause here and actually show you the statute. Pulled it up before. Um, here we go. Yes, here is... Uh, section 7, um, employees shall have the right to self-organize, to form, join, or assist labor organizations, to bargain collectively through representation, representatives of their own choosing, and to engage in other concerted activities for the purpose of collective bargaining or other mutual aid or protection, and shall also have the right to refrain, this is the part that was added later on, from any and all of these actions except to the extent that such action may be affected by an agreement requiring membership in a labor organization as a condition of employment as authorized by this act. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a later uh, presentation. I'm also going to take a second just to show you our local office of the NLRB. We're in Region 16 here. You can see that covers uh, the state of Texas, and our regional office is in Fort Worth. Obviously, there are lots of regional offices, at least 16, right? You can do the math there. Um, regional offices kind of tend to have a personality associated with them. Uh, some offices tend to be more pro-union. Some offices tend to be more pro-management. Historically, the Fort Worth office has a reputation of being more pro-management. Um, the uh, 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 board agents who work there are usually attorneys. So if you decide to go to law school and decide to practice in the labor area, uh, definitely a place where many uh, labor attorneys begin their career as being a board agent for the NLRB. And so that's a, definitely a career path to consider um, in your uh, life journey, so to speak. So let's talk about this concept, concerted activity. We have this word here, 
Okay, so this is activity that is undertaken with or on behalf of other employees, not on behalf of an individual employee alone. So if I have a personal grievance, hey, I would like to have the Friday after Thanksgiving off. And so I'm going to go talk to my boss about whether I can get that Friday off or not. Perfectly legitimate thing for me to want to do, but it doesn't count as concerted activity. But let's say that I get together with some of my colleagues and say, hey, you know what? I think we all should have that Friday after Thanksgiving off. I think this whole facility ought to be closed on that day so we can enjoy time with our family. And so if I go to my boss now and say, I represent a group of my colleagues and we all want to have that day off. Well, now I'm engaging in concerted activity because I'm working with others or at least on behalf of others to accomplish this goal. You can see it's undertaken in mutual aid or support of a group. Again, not solely for my own benefit. Yes, I want the Friday after Thanksgiving off, but it's also going to help all the other people who want the Friday after Thanksgiving off. The activity has to be related to, this shouldn't be ages, it should be wages. Sorry about that. Wages, hours, and terms and conditions of employment. The same things we talked about before. Well, certainly holidays would be a term and condition of employment. And the activity that we engage in, how we express our concerted activity, must not be extreme or abusive, malicious, defamatory, or highly profane. So if I go into my boss's office and say, we want to have the Friday after Thanksgiving off, and he goes, can't do it, and then I punch him in the nose, <laughs> once my fist connects with his nose, I have uh, ceased engaging in lawful construct concerted activity. Um, now, many uh, organized and unionized uh, situations, language can be a little salty. And so the fact that I might uh, say something that I wouldn't want my grandmother to hear uh, would not make it uh, necessarily highly profane. Uh, so a few uh, naughty words sprinkled into my, my talking, especially in a work environment where uh, you know, people maybe speak in a little bit of an earthy manner, uh, would not render my behavior to uh, not be concerted. But of course, if I start saying to my boss, you're a blankety blank who cheating on his wife or cheating on her husband or um, stealing from the company, uh, you know, blah, 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 that type of thing, again, my behavior has ceased to be lawful concerted activity um, under those circumstances. Concerted activity also includes attempts when an employee is trying to persuade another employee to join the union. And so that would be protected activity. There's no union in place right now, but my effort to persuade my colleague, I might be talking about the benefits of unionization. And even if that colleague of mine doesn't, isn't interested in joining the union, my attempt at that, because I don't know if it's going to be discussed or not until they try, right? My attempt at that would be considered concerted activity. And as I said before, concerted activity often does rise in non-union settings. So again, concerted activity can be in a union setting, but it can also be in a setting where the workforce, there's an attempt to organize the workforce, or perhaps there's no attempts to organize the workforce. All those situations can be concerted activity. And this, this one can be dangerous because uh, even uh, uh, legal professionals uh, oftentimes aren't thinking about activity as being concerted activity. So when employees uh, complain about something, uh, there may be the temptation to think, oh, they just should just be quiet. Uh, they're, they're, they're annoying us, um, when in fact they're engaging in legally protected behavior. So let's talk about people who aren't covered by the National Labor Relations Act, because there are some. For example, agricultural workers are not covered. We also saw before that railway and airline, rail, railway and airline workers are not covered. Domestic workers, in other words, people who are chefs and butlers and uh, maids and janitors and homes are not covered. If you work for your parent or your spouse, unfortunately, you can't organize. That wouldn't be good for Thanksgiving dinner, right? Independent contractors can't organize. Um, you have to be an employee to organize. You may recall back when we talked about the difference between independent contractors and employees, we talked at length about 
DNLRA um, and the definition that DNLRA does. And so this is an important distinction. And then, of course, supervisors and managers cannot be covered. Um, but part-time workers can be covered. Um, and so that is not uh, a category that is excluded. As we said before, the NLRE established the National Labor Relations Board, which is usually called the NLRB, and it is an independent regulatory administration agency. Um, it's kind of like the EEOC in that sense. Um, obviously, it's regulating something different than the EOC, but it is a governmental agency um, that has a lot of autonomy, and it's going to regulate the management behavior in these situations, the behavior of labor unions in these situations, and also the behavior of labor union members. And as I said before, this was initially in response to the Great Depression, but of course it continues to have relevance even today. So what, who makes up the NLRB? Well, the NLRB is, and there's kind of two ways to use the term NLRB or National Labor Relations Board. One is to talk about the five people who are literally on the board. Um, but most of the time when people talk about the NLRB, they're talking about the whole governmental agency, which involves thousands of employees. So it can be a little bit confusing which one of those terms you mean. Uh, the NLRB is made up of five members and they are appointed by the president. Uh, historically, the president, let's say the president is currently a Democrat, he or she is going to be able to appoint three members. And then the other two would be of the opposing party, the Republicans in this case. Um, the uh, members of the board have um, uh, uh, terms of office that, uh, you know, are, are kind of stair step that they don't all uh, come up at the same time. So a president may not always have um, the, the three two composition, but at least that's the plan. And as I said before, this is a Republican president and that president would have three Republican members and two Democratic members. And of course, there are their staffs. There's a general council, and of course, the general council has its staff, and then the regional offices. Um, so this is a, a pretty significant size bureaucracy. Uh, I already showed you where our office was located. Um, the NLRB has jurisdiction only in regard to labor dis disputes that affect co inter you know, interstate commerce. Again, that's always a requirement because Congress can't regulate things that are not interstate commerce. But it's pretty rare that there's a labor dispute that doesn't affect interstate commerce because, again, that term is really, really broadly understood today. Um, but the NLRB does not have jurisdiction over governmental employees. So that is one category that is exempt from the scope of the NLRB. The NLRB is part of the Department of Labor. Um, and uh, let's talk about the process by which a ULP uh, advances through the, um, the system. So let's imagine that an employee of an employer um, feels that it's empo his employer has uh, committed an unfair labor practice against him. Let's say he was involved in uh, union organizing. He was a vocal supporter of the union and he uh, uh, was late to work one day and he was fired for being late. But he feels that that was not in uh, in uh, consistency with the company's ordinary uh, uh, policies and practices with respect to terminations for late. So he feels like he was really dismissed because of his support of the union, which of course would be a ULP. So the first thing that he does is he files a charge with the National Labor Relations Board. In this case, let's say that this is a company that is in Collin County, he's gonna go on over to the Fort Worth office. Um, and his action is going to cause an investigation to begin. A board agent is likely to show up at the employer and start interviewing employees. If the board agent, who's probably an attorney, is, uh, concludes that yes, in fact, a unfair labor practice has occurred, then the board agent is going to issue what's called a complaint. Um, and this is basically saying what, it feel, what he feels or she feels um, was unlawful uh, about what the employer did. Um, we're going to skip to this step. So um, let's assume that the, uh, the grievance process doesn't work if, if the grievance process is used. And so now there's going to be a hearing. 
and there's going to be a hearing in front of an ALJ, an administrative law judge. So the National Labor Relations Board has its own court system, and so it has its own judges. Um, these judges um, just handle uh, disputes relating to union issues, and ULP disputes are a very common one. And so the board agent is going to act as the prosecutor. That's why they're attorneys, right? And so he or she is going to be, in some sense, representing the um, uh, person who filed the charge and seeking to get this person reinstated and also to get this person's back wages satisfied. And also uh, very likely to require that the employer post a notice uh, telling the employees that the employer has violated um, the, uh, has committed an unfair labor practice. So kind of, um, I guess you could say, embarrass the employer in front of it, its employees. So that's the goal of the board, of the um, uh, 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 board agent in this process. And so witnesses are called. It, it works very much like a normal trial. It usually happens at the employer's facility because most of the um, uh, witnesses are going to be employees, current or former, of the employer. So it's a convenient place. And so it's, it's not in a courtroom, but it, it functions in a similar way. Uh, witnesses are under oath. Witnesses are subject to subpoena. Uh, there is no jury. It will be the administrative law judge who reaches a finding. And then the judge will make a recommendation based upon the evidence that he or she has heard. And that recommendation will go to the board, those five people who uh, review that information. Uh, if the board agrees with the, uh, of course, if, if the judge says, no, I don't think there was an unfair labor practice, the board obviously can agree or disagree with the judge. Uh, probably the board in that situation would agree with the judge. And so that would close that particular matter. But let's assume that the judge said, I think that there was an unfair labor practice. And so the board will then have to decide whether it agrees with the judge or not. If it agrees, it will issue a cease and desist order and it will award the um, um, employee appropriate remedial uh, relief reinstatement and possibly back pay or probably back pay under those circumstances. Um, usually at this point, the uh, company is um, likely to say, well, we don't agree with what the ALJ and the board have said. And by the way, this whole process has taken years. Um, the, whatever the union campaign that was going on that motivated this employee to begin these actions has long since stopped. Either the union has, was voted in or not. But literally, this takes years to do. Uh, the NLRB is very, very backlogged. So in this situation, um, uh, the employer may simply say, no, we're not doing it. Or the employer, and if the employer says that, then the board is going to um, uh, file a petition with a US Court of Appeal uh, seeking uh, to enforce the order of the board. And that will require that the US Court of Appeal review the record. And if the Court of Appeal agrees with the employer that in fact there was not an unfair labor practice, uh, then the, of course, order will be um, ended. If the if Court of Appeals agrees with the board that in fact there was an unfair labor practice, then the employer will have to comply with uh, that remediation. Um, alternatively, the employer can take the case directly to the uh, US Court of Appeals for um, resolution of that dispute. Let me go back though, I didn't talk about a different thing that might happen and that is, um, you know, the investigation occurs, the board agent hears the evidence. If the board agent concludes that no, in his opinion, there was not an unfair labor practice that happened. In that case, the matter is over. The employee has no right of appeal. The employee has no ability to file his own lawsuit. There is no right to sue letter like we see in employment law cases. So the NLRB has a significantly more power than the EOC uh, to uh, decide kind of what the course of this dispute is going to be. Remember, the EOC can't force an employer to do anything. The NLRB does have the capacity to force an employer to do something. Similarly, the EEOC can't stop an employee from pursuing a lawsuit, whereas the NLRB can close off that opportunity for an employee. So the NLRB is a much more powerful agency 
The scope of its power may be uh, affect a smaller part of the economy in the United States, but what it can affect, it can affect much more strongly. At this point, we have uh, completed our discussion about the history of, of unionization, and we've done an overview of the Wagoner portion of the NLRA. We've also discussed the topic of concerted activity by employees, both in unionized and non-unionized settings. In future elections, we'll, it's not future elections, in future uh, speech or speech, uh, lectures, we'll talk about uh, issues such as union campaigns in elections, collective bargaining, uh, the possibility of strikes. We'll talk a little bit more about unfair labor practices, and we'll discuss the uh, uh, amendments to the NLRA that were part of the Taft-Hartley Act, including the right to work laws. We'll discuss the Landrum-Griffin Act, which is also an amendment to the NLRA, and we'll discuss the topic of public sector unions. I hope that this presentation has been helpful for you. If you have any questions about the content we've talked about, please don't hesitate to pop into my office hours. I'd be glad to discuss them in more detail with you. I thank you for your attention and have a wonderful day.